This video is sponsored by Squarespace. So you've heard about the A12 and the SR71, but there was also another member of this family that was quite interesting, and it's the one that we're going to cover today. The fighter interceptor variant of the A12 was almost a thing back in the early 60s, but there were simply too many factors that led to its downfall. Stick around to see why this aircraft never entered serial production and what happened to the prototypes and the pilots who used to fly them. This plane goes Mach 3, it's faster than anything the Russians have, but it's not a spy plane, it's a fighter interceptor. The late 50s were all about supersonic aircraft. Many projects on both sides of the Iron Curtain were focused on developing fighters, bombers and interceptors to counter the other side, with the United States Air Force just about to replace their F-106 Delta Dart with the North American XF-108 Rapier. However, developing a completely new aircraft meant a lot of money and that's where Lockheed, more specifically the famous engineer Kelly Johnson, came up with a new idea that could change everything. The Skunk Works department of Lockheed was tasked with black projects throughout the Cold War and was already working on the A-12. This was a project financed by that shady group, the CIA, and was made to replace the U-2, eventually with the irony being that it was actually the U-2 that outlived all other projects to this day. Anyway, Johnson figured out that his company could fulfill the Air Force requirements for a new supersonic interceptor by simply modifying the platform that they already had available, and went to the Air Force officials with the idea. They did approve the project and it was decided for three prototypes to be built because it was a viable yet much cheaper option to the XF-108 program. And so the YF-12 came to life. I love the fact that the engineers behind the SR-71 saw their creation and tried to use it from everything from a spy plane to an interceptor to even a drone mothership. But as cool as this was, the project was top secret for many years, leaving researchers like me wishing that they had just used a Squarespace website. That's right, today's video sponsor is the perfect way to tell the world all about your cool project. From businesses to blogs to top secret military research projects, Squarespace makes it easy. Their sites have powerful email campaign tools, optimization for mobile phones, and built-in e-commerce platforms. The Russians wouldn't embarrass themselves by trying to shoot down an SR-71 when they could have just added it to cart, it's that easy. As a found and explained viewer, you get 10% off your first site and domain on Squarespace and a free fuzzy feeling knowing that you are supporting the channel just by clicking the link below. Back to our top secret interceptor. Now, Johnson may have bit off a little bit more than he could chew. To create an interceptor out of a reconnaissance aircraft was a tricky thing, so the first task was to incorporate radar and weaponry. The nose section was slightly modified, clipping a part of the flat wing extensions to accommodate the Hughes's ANASG-18 radar, one developed originally for the Rapier. Along with a new powerful radar, the YF-12 was also equipped with an IRST, or more simply, a infrared sensor to track targets based on heat signatures. All the cameras and other recon equipment was scrapped to create space for a weapons bay. The new bay was split into four compartments, with one storing weapon control systems and the other three actual missiles. You see, because of the aerodynamic complexity of the aircraft, it was impossible to have missiles carried externally, or any other weaponry obviously, so the only option was an internal weapons bay. 
AIM-47 Falcons was the main armament selected for the YF-12, a mid to long range missile with a warhead large enough to shoot down a Soviet bomber. There was even an option of a smaller nuclear warhead to arm to this missile as well. So not only was his fighter interceptor faster than any bomber that the Soviets could muster, it could also annihilate them as well. Talk about overkill. In total, seven missiles were fired from the YF-12 during testing, with only one failing to hit its target. Another big change compared to the original design were fins on the underside of the fuselage and both of the engines respectively, which were to provide stabilization during the flight, much needed because the A-12 as a platform wasn't really the most steerable thing, and with the modifications done, it just got worse. It's interesting to mention that the fin in the middle was so large that it had to be folded down during takeoffs and landings, similar to what the Soviet MiG-23 had as a design choice in the future. Speaking of funny connections, there's also one between the YF-12 and the F-14 Tomcat, but we'll get to that in a minute. Before ending the design story, one more important thing to mention is that the YF-12 was a twin-seater. Apart from the pilot, there was also a weapons officer to focus on combat while the pilot would steer the already complex machine. So this plane was incredible. It was fast, it could carry nukes, and it was cheaper than the other options on the table. So what the hell happened? After the successful initial tests, the US Air Force actually signed a serial production contract with Lockheed for 93 aircraft. However, the order was cancelled shortly after because of two things. First, the war in Vietnam placed severe financial pressure on all branches of the US military, and developing new experimental aircraft wasn't the priority at the time. And the second is the fact that nuclear warfare completely changed the game when the Soviets developed the first ICBMs based on the R-7 rocket, the rules of engagement were now completely different. Nobody needed Mark III interceptors to chase down bombers when the bombs themselves were no longer carried by planes. With the cancellation of the project, so was the dream of a fighter interceptor based on the A-12 platform. But still, this was just the beginning of the legacy it would leave behind. Apart from the further development and the use of the SR-71 in the future, it was NASA who wanted to get their hands on the YF-12 prototypes and use them for their own research. This helped them immensely because Mach 3 capable research platforms weren't something just lying around or easy to build. James Irwin, one of the initial test pilots, actually went on to build his career in NASA and became one of the few people who walked on the moon with the Apollo 15 mission. And remember that Tomcat connection? Well, the radar used on the YF-12 was in basis in developing the new radar for the F-14 down the line, and the legendary AIM-54 Phoenix missiles used by the F-14 were, you guessed it, and probably noticed thus far, based on the AIM-47 design. And a last little fun detail was the similarities in design of those stabilizing fins below the engines of the YF-12 and F-14. And the trivia doesn't end there. President Lloyd Johnson actually used the YF-12 as a cover for the inevitable questions that the A-12 and SR-71 would raise. It was demonstrated to the public and described as a new fighter to fool the KGB and hide the true purpose of the secret CIA project that was behind it, keeping the SR-71 secret for much longer. And last but not least, whatever happened to the prototypes? One of the three prototypes built was lost in an accident, with the pilots ejecting in time and surviving, but the airframe was completely destroyed. 
The second one was also damaged but was partially salvaged and then used to create the only SR-71C, disguised under the name YF-12C. The third survived throughout the years and after completing its career and service, it was moved to the US Air Force National Museum in Ohio, where you can see it today. So thank you dear viewer for watching yet another Found and Explained video. If you like this story or many others on the channel, please do hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you want to support me on Patreon or become a channel member and unlock extra content, the link is in the description down below. Once again, and thank you all for watching and I'll see you again soon.